Um, you see before you today uh, something that you've probably never seen before. I am a rare creature indeed. I'm what's known as a Melanchthon scholar. That's right. You've cited one. I know you've never cited one before. That's me. It was a, you know, unlike uh, Steve's decision in graduate school, uh, mine was a terrible career choice, to be honest with you. Everybody wants to hear about Luther. Nobody wants to hear about Melanchthon. Everybody loves Luther. People have literally made careers out of hating Melanchthon. There's a great American uh, Melanchthon scholar. It's not me. His name's Timothy Wenger. For years, he gave it the old college try, making a career out of talking about Melanchthon. And recently, over the last five or six years, he's kind of given up. He started talking about Luther. <clears throat> I, don't, I really don't blame him. So here we go. Today, and especially we're a little short on time, so I'm going to, I've lovingly entitled this lecture, What Drove Melanchthon's Pen? Melanchthon on Law and Gospel. I know that's a mouthful. This really will be one of those fire hose lectures. I'm going to go as fast as I can, which means you're going to open your mouth or your ears, and I'm going to turn on the fire hose, and I'm just going to let it rip. In this lecture, there are many direct quotes uh, that have come from Melanchthon's pen. This is intentional on my part. Um, most people are somewhat familiar with Luther. In fact, if you get on good old Google and you type in Luther quotes, you'll probably get a handful from Martin Luther King Jr., but you'll get a plethora of quotes um, from Martin Luther. If you do the same thing with Melanchthon, um, I'm not even sure what will show up, but probably not much. Most people have never read Melanchthon. Uh, very little of Melanchthon's uh, work is translated into English. Um, in fact, the stuff that is translated is often the same thing, translated once and then translated again and then translated again. And so there's not a lot of variety out there. My biggest goal today um, was to do two things. Introduce you just briefly to the life and work of Philip Melanchthon. And secondly, to let you hear Melanchthon's voice. Um, something which few have done in the last 500 years and something that I so often am privileged to do and I want to share that with you a little bit. So part one, historical background. This is important because uh, Martin Luther actually showed up to carry the water for Steve. You know, Steve didn't actually have to introduce any of Martin Luther's life because Luther showed up at lunch and did that for him. Um, I don't know where Melanchthon was. He was probably in the library like he usually was, studying or something like that. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a background, okay? Melanchthon is primarily known in theological circles, if he's known at all, mostly as just Melanchthon's good friend and colleague at the University of Wittenberg. He's a fellow reformer. He's born in 1497. He dies in 1560. <clears throat> Again, friend of Luther. He's known primarily as a humanist, and that's of the Renaissance sort, somebody who's um, well-versed in many different academic subjects, not the modern-day secular humanist sort like we sometimes think. He's a philologist. That means he's an expert in ancient languages. He's a theologian. He's a philosopher. He's a mathematician. He's a historian, an educator. In fact, he's called the great preceptor or the great educator of Germany. He's an author, prolific author, actually wrote more than Luther did, if you can believe that. He's known as an administrator, having served one term as chancellor of the University of Wittenberg, theological ambassador, confessor, author of the Augsburg Confession, the Apology to the Augsburg Confession, the Power Primacy of the Pope, and many other confessions that did not make it into the Book of Concord. He's a hymnist, a husband, and father, and actually I'm sure I left many things out. In 1497, he's born to a man named George Schwarzschild, who's a master of gunnery arts and essentially a blacksmith. He makes lightweight armor. He's so good at it that he becomes the armorer for the emperor. He's a blacksmith, like my son Joshua, who has his wares outside. You might want to check him out. It's pretty good. He makes knives. They look like this. Anyway, <clears throat> check it out. <clears throat> Second son, Ironworks. Okay, we're done with that. Um, his mother's name is Barbara. She comes from a wealthy merchant family of Reuter. Melanchthon's grandfather steps in pretty early on to ensure that uh, Melanchthon and his brother receive a good education. This was not a common thing yet, pre-Reformation. But his grandfather steps in and he actually hires for the, the Schwarzschild boys uh, a private tutor, a man named Johannes Unger of Forzheim, very well-known Latin scholar himself. He teaches the boys Latin and eventually Greek. Melanchthon also has another education connection in his great uncle Reuchlin, who is himself a famous humanist scholar and Hebraist 
and a master of Greek. Melanchthon becomes so good at Greek very early on in his life that this Uncle Reuchlin of his actually changes his name from Schwarzschild, which is German for, to, for black earth, to Melanchthon, the Greek version of the name. This is what Reuchlin says of the young Melanchthon. Your name is, your name is Schwarzschild, German for black earth, yet you are a Greek. And so your new name shall be Greek. Thus I will call you Melanchthon, which means black earth. This happens in 1509 when Melanchthon is just 12 years old. 12 years old. After moving to Wittenberg, he marries a Katie as well, Catherine von Krapp in 1522. She's actually the daughter of the mayor of Wittenberg, and together they have four children, Anna, Philip, George, and Magdalena. His education is very impressive. Like I said, he's a trained philologist and classical scholar. In 1509, he enters the University of Heidelberg to pursue a BA degree, graduates in 1512. He's born in 1497, which means he graduates with his BA at 15 years old. There he studies philosophy, rhetoric, astronomy, astrology, Latin, and Greek. He desires to pursue a Master of Arts degree at the University of Heidelberg, but he's turned down. He's not turned down because his grades were bad, he's turned down because his grades were too good. You see, the faculty and the other students at the university did not want him there anymore. They made him, he made them look bad. He had this 15-year-old running around schooling them on Latin and Greek and classical studies and mathematics and history, and they couldn't stand it. They said, go somewhere else. So at the advice of his great uncle Reuchlin, he applies to the University of Tübingen in 1512. He, he enters that university. In 1516, he graduates with an MA degree. 1516, he's got a Master of Arts degree. Born 1497, he's 19 years old. He studies there philosophy, Latin, Greek, classical literature, law, medicine, and mathematics. Soon thereafter, he accepts a call, 1518, accepts a call to the University of Wittenberg where he, as professor of Greek where he meets Martin Luther. And there with Luther, he begins to study Hebrew, eventually becomes a master of Hebrew. And even though his Hebrew studies begin under Luther's instruction, very quickly Luther acknowledges that Melanchthon is a better Hebraist than he. He also begins to study theology, not only under Luther's tutelage, but by teaching the Gospel of John and Paul's epistle to the church at Rome in Greek to his students. He decides to pursue a theologi theological degree, and in 1519 he graduates with a BA in theology, 1519, again, he's still only 21, three degrees under his belt. 1519, with a degree in theology, we might call this degree these, these days an MDiv, a Master of Divinity. It's in his baccalaureate thesis as early as 1519 that the term imputation is first used during the Reformation to describe how Christ's righteousness is imparted to the believer. When he says in that baccalaureate thesis, all righteousness is a gracious, gracious imputation of Christ. Throughout his career, he so holds many vocations. Again, he's called as professor of Greek, 1518. After 1519, when he is granted that degree in theology, he holds a double call to the university, professor of Greek and professor of theology, actually receiving a double paycheck too for that, which Luther advocated for. Throughout his career as a theologian, he's essentially an exegete, who dabbles in systematics. This means that he is one who studies and expounds the theology based on the study of scripture in the original languages. This is what Melanchthon says about a theologian. He says, every theologian and faithful interpreter of the heavenly doctrine must first necessarily be a philologist or an exegete in our terms, an expert in the languages. He wrote several seminal philosophical and historical works. We don't have any records of him actually preaching, but his postals and his instructions on how to preach, including the development of what we call the methodical style of preaching, which I would argue most people, if you're a pastor in the LCMS, this is probably how you preach, was developed by Philip Melanchthon. He took, again, he took at least one turn as chief administrator, chancellor of the University of Wittenberg, this is an interesting one. He made regular overtures and trips on behalf of the evangelical princes in the cause of the Reformation. And as Bob Kolb argues, he became its primary and chief theological ambassador. His chief work, one which, beyond the Augsburg Confession and the Apology, one which influenced pastors and was used to train pastors for over a hundred years, is the Loci Communis or the Loci Communis Theologici 
Pretty simply put, common topics or common topics of theology. You see, Melanchthon is, uh, is the first systematizer or the first dogmatician of the Lutheran and even Protestant faith. While Dr. Luther was busy spending his time contending with various papal bulls against him, confessing the Christian faith at Worms and other places, and writing sermons for preaching in the castle church and elsewhere, Melanchthon was at work developing the first system of theology. This work was destined to exert powerful influence not only on the Lutheran church, but even on Luther and in the Reformation. It, may, it marks an epoch in the history of Christian theology. In this, little, in this work, which he developed over time, Melanchthon uses a strictly biblical theology gleaned from the Holy Scriptures, but employs an ordering of thought that he gets from classical authors like Aristotle, Cicero, and Quintilian. So what is his theological method? Melanchthon, again, relies throughout his life on the Lochi method of organization and systemization. He literally believes and states on more than one occasion that this method is from God. Says Melanchthon, God has made men in such a way that they think by way of numbers and arrangement, and when learning one thing or another, they are often helped by numbering and ordered arrangement. So, following classical authors, Melanchthon's method flows from the text. Thus, his method is to, one, search the text of Holy Scripture and find the claims therein. Two, categorize those textual claims. Three, park those claims in their proper places. In other words, organize them. Four, combine claims that are in common. Five, prioritize the strong topics over the weak ones. He's a smart guy, and his study in theology and philosophy extends beyond just the classical authors and into what we would call the medieval period and the scholastic period. So he's also aware of something called the medieval disputatio, another way of organizing thought and asking questions to try to find truth. So Melanchthon will often ask some questions connected with that method too when he approaches the text or when he gleans a doctrine that he thinks has weight. He'll ask, Vasistas, what is this thing? What are its parts? What are the species therein? What are its causes? To what is it related? Hence, what ends up as priority topics for Melanchthon are law and gospel and justification by grace through faith on account of Christ alone. These literally become, for the rest of his life, his interpretive claims. So law and gospel. Let's do a little theological method from Melanchthon. What is this? What does this word mean? Law, says Melanchthon. This is the doctrine where we are shown to be exposed before God. It commands qualities which we are not capable of, which we leave undone, and that demands perfect obedience to God and which condemns those who do not stand before God in perfect obedience. So what are its parts? Well, the law is human and divine, external and internal, says Melanchthon. As an example, it's pretty easy to think of the difference that was already pointed out earlier today between fornication and lust, or adultery and lust. Or think of the difference between murder and hate, internal and external. Says Melanchthon, the law of God requires not only resistance in the external actions, which many of our speakers have pointed out, including Jared Wilson, is quite easy. He's gone his 42 years without killing anybody. I've gone 45, although it's been close on some days. <laughs> it's about as close as I get to humor, by the way. <clears throat> <laughs> it's a known fact that Norwegians are better Germ than Germans at humor. And though I'm not German, I am Scottish, which is apparently close enough. <clears throat> So what are its, but here we go. The law of God not only requires restraint in external actions, but also in inwardly bent affections. What are the species, says Melanchthon? The law of nature, the divine law, and the human law. What are its causes? Pretty simple here. God's immutable, unchanging goodness given so that we know we are sinners in need of a savior. 
Here Melanchthon says, quote, but God's law not only forbids or requires external actions, the easy one, it not only requires diligence, a little harder, such as the philosopher's command, but it pushes against our passions, what we want, and requires that they, that they concur with the law of God so that now even our original sin is repugnant to the law of God. To what is this thing related? Well, to the Decalogue and to what he and others have called the two tables of the law therein. Here Melanchthon claims, quote, there are two tables, the first of which contains the works, which properly speaking deal with what we must do with God, namely the true worship of God, internal and external. The second contained works towards our neighbor, interior and exterior. And at times these are to be distinguished. The first contains the spiritual life, those things that we are seemingly doing for God. And the second, the political life, those things that we are seemingly doing for our neighbor. And then it gets sticky. It gets real sticky because he asks a question. It's the question which dogs us to this day. Again, you might, I may have termed it positively here. Melanchthon is possibly helpful here. Possibly not. In dividing the law into what is sometimes called uses. But what we will today call functions. Because uses sucks. <laughs> I promised at least I wouldn't cuss <laughs> anymore in these. I'm doing well, at least. <clears throat> What's that? Yeah. This category seeks to answer this question. What does the law do? According to Melanchthon, it does or functions, does three things or functions in three ways. We'll go with functions. It functions civilly, it functions theologically, and it functions as a rule for Christians. The civil function, that's the first function, is what we often in catechism classes call the curb, right? It's that thing that keeps us within the boundaries. Not anymore because we drive so fast, but curbs used to do that. <laughs> Says Melanchthon, the first, the civil office, namely that all things are maintained by a certain external discipline. And for this discipline, God has ordained certain people and entities and things. First, parents. Second, the civil law and its magistrates. Three, common instruction. Four, punishments. And five, human suffering. Human suffering. Next, the theological function. This is the mirror, the one that shows us our sin. Says Melanchthon of this one, the second office belongs to the divine law and is the chief office. It shows us our sin and accuses us, petrifies us, and condemns the conscience. We often, again, call this the mirror. When I explain this to my students at Concordia, I say, this is not just a mirror. This is like my wife's awful makeup mirror. You know, not the one-time magnification mirror that you can some days look in, look in and go, I look pretty good. It's that one that your wife keeps on the counter to pluck eyebrows or to put on her makeup. And every time you walk by it, you're tempted to look into it. And as you do, you see every expanded pore and blackhead and zit on your face. And you think, oh my gosh, that can't be me. That's the second function of the law. Is that me? You bet your bippy it is. <laughs> but you may ask, as I have, if Christ frees us from the condemnation inherent to the second function of the law... Do Christians still have any use for the law? I think this is perhaps better asked. Is it still necessary for the law to be preached among Christians? This was the debate in Melanchthon's time. This is debate, debate, believe it or not, in our time. The fear is falling into what's called antinomianism or literally lawlessness. This is expressly what the teaching of the third function of the law hopes and hopes to avoid. Does it do that? I don't know. Here it is. Here Melanchthon teaches that the just, in the third function of law, Melanchthon teaches that the justified sinner being redeemed on account of Christ alone understands the law's demands from a different perspective. Thus he says this, the third office of the law in those who are justified by faith is that which teaches them about good works and teaches them what works are pleasing to God. It therefore pleases God that this obedience is begun in us 
but only because we are pleasing to God on account of Christ. So you ask, as I often do, what do I do when I fail according to this third function of the law? Well, I say to you, not Melanchthon, you will fail. You will always fail. Thus we say you remain a saved saint and at the same time a saved, dirty, rotten sinner. When you fail even that third function of the law, and you will, you flee to the cross of Christ for redemption, for forgiveness, for hope, for salvation, for freedom, and for renewal. So then Melanchthon says also the law is accuser. So that the law does many things, and we can acknowledge that, or it has many functions, and we may want or not want to acknowledge that. It also, do, it primarily does one thing. It accuses you, the sinner, of your sin. This does not mean that its only function is to accuse. Rather, that, it, it, that in its other functions, no matter what else we think it is doing, exhorting, training, holding things together, it always accuses. Thus, we confess with Melanchthon, lex semper accuset. The law always accuses. The law accuses us in our natural states apart from Christ. Our vicious affections, as Melanchthon says, will always lead us away from God's mercy and towards self-reliance and thereby all away from salvation that only comes on account of Christ. Therefore, by the law, not only comes inward accusation, but especially, as Steve and I discussed the other day on the podcast, inward terror of the conscience, leaving Christ alone as the only option for the consolation of that terrified conscience. So says Melanchthon here, the law always accuses and makes the conscience to doubt whether God is well pleased with us or wants to hear us. But the gospel, because it teaches that we are reconciled to God freely on account of Christ, therefore frees us from this doubt. So then he turns to the gospel. And perhaps we know, and perhaps we know only one thing very well at this point in the lecture, that the law accuses the sinner of their sin. It accuses me always of my sin. It accuses you always of your sin. So what is the gospel? Well, says Melanchthon, is the evangelium, the word from which we get the concept of evangelism. It is good news. I often tell my students, it's good news, but it's not any good news. It's not when you're a you little spoiled brat, you're when your parent, OC parent calls you up and says, I just bought you a new Maserati, which would be pretty good news, admittedly. I would like a Maserati. <clears throat> it's not any good news. <laughs> it's good news for you. It's the good news that Christ's death and resurrection is for you. Not conditioned, not coerced, not demanded, not predicated on the law, but given freely on account of Christ. Again, Melanchthon likes to break things into parts and categories. He's sort of neurotic about it. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that. So as he's apt to do, he categorizes the definition of the gospel into three parts or components. So he says, let this be the definition of the gospel in which three components are embraced as the proper benefit of the gospel. Namely that one, our sins are freely forgiven for Christ's sake. Two, we are graciously pronounced righteous. And three, that we are reconciled and received as heirs to eternal life. Pretty darn good news. I'm doing well. <clears throat> what is the gospel's connection to the law? What an odd question. Melanchthon asks that question. Says Melanchthon, the other promises are the, prom the gospel proper. This does not have as a cause the condition of the law. That is... The promise is not given on account of the, your fulfillment of the law, but freely on account of Christ. This is the promise of remission of sins or reconciliation or justification of which the gospel specifically speaks for you. So what is to be discerned here? Well, I think it's important that distinctions are made between commandments 
those things that God says you must do, and promises, the things God says he has done already for you on account of Christ. Here says Melanchthon, it is certain that it is necessary to distinguish between the commandments and the forgiveness of sins, between the moral precepts and the promises, and also between the promises, those that are free promises and those that are not free. Yet even though the gospel speaks of repentance, Steve spoke about this, and good works, the benefits that are given are contained in the promise of Christ, which is the fundamental and proper doctrine of the gospel and satisfaction of the law for the remission of sins given freely. And it, the gospel, declares us righteous, even though we do not satisfy the law. The gospel and its power. So then the gospel has power, or even better said, possibly the gospel is power. What kind of power? The power of God to all those who believe. More specifically, it's declarative power. The accusation of the law against the sinner is a legal accusation. That is, it rightly claims that the sinner has not obeyed God's commands or desired God's will be done outwardly or inwardly. This disobedience results in our condemnation and bondage to sin, death, and the power of the devil. The gospel's power declares the sinner just, even though that sinner is unjust. So then Melanchthon says, quoting Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was declared, imputed, or credited to him as righteousness. Scripture expressly affirms that Abraham was pronounced just because he believed, that is, because he was established in faith. God was propitious to him, not on account of his own dignity or merit or works, but through the mercy of God promised to him in the gospel of Christ Jesus. As my good friend and mentor, Dr. Rod Rosenblatt, always used to say, the gospel is the dynamite of salvation, exploding faith into the heart of the believer. And we can easily see this in the text from Scripture, Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First the Jew, then the Gentile. Romans 10.17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. And so many others. And the gospel is freedom. We have that all over the place here. Freedom is an interesting concept. Freedom implies a question. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin, or really the law's condemnation of our sinfulness. Death and the power of the devil to stand as our accuser. Since then the law no longer accuses us, we are free indeed. Free to be saved by grace through faith on account of Christ alone and for his sake alone, God has mercy on us. The gospel is that thing which brings this message, or rather it is the message through which the Holy Spirit works saving faith or trust or help heartfelt confidence that clings to the benefits of Christ alone. This the law is not capable of doing. Only the gospel contains this promise or has this power. So says Melanchthon, the gospel is freely given as a message of freedom. According to Melanchthon, the gospel is precisely that thing that sets our consciences free from the terror of the accusations of the law. The power that death holds on us, the sin that binds us to the law, and the devil who loves to use our sin against us. The gospel as propter Christum or on account of Christ. Quite simply, the gospel saves. The law does not. Saves you, the sinner, on account of Christ alone. The message of the gospel is Christ from beginning to end for you. On account of Christ or propter Christum. Melanchthon uses this phrase time and time again. It means for the sake of, because of, on account of. And it always points to Christ as the means and mode of the sinner's salvation. Again, says Melanchthon, accordingly, 
The term free to, freely does not exclude faith, but removes the condition of our dignity and works and transfers the cause to our benefit in Christ. Neither is our obedience excluded, yet the total cause of the benefit is transferred from our obedience to Christ so that the benefit is certain. So what about our reason in all of this? After all, this gospel, as we've heard it so many times this weekend, sounds like utter nonsense. It simply does not make any sense. At least, this is what our opponents seem to be saying. This is what Melanchthon has to say to that. Then there is the preaching of the gospel, repentance and promise, which reason does not naturally grasp but it is revealed by God when God promises that he remits our sin on account of Christ alone. You see, the proclamation of the gospel is evangelism. At 1517, we are very concerned with this. We are very concerned with proclaiming the gospel of Christ. It is in our mission statement that we want to share the gospel of Christ Jesus with as many people as possible in as many ways as possible. And we think we're following Christ on this when he tells his disciples in the last chapter of Matthew to go into all the world, telling them about me and baptizing them in my name. So what is this thing the apostles are to tell the world? What is this thing we are to tell the world? It's the good news of the gospel of Christ Jesus. So we reach out with the gospel. We do not keep it in but rather take it out to all the world, to everyone, not just to the LCMS, not just to Lutherans, not just to Christians, for God's sake, to all the world. As my friend Dan Van Voris, who could not be with us, said so many times, the whole world is dying. What else would you have us do? To evangelize is to bring the gospel the good news of Christ for sinners. This is the message of freedom, the message of hope, and the message of salvation to sinners for the sake of Christ, for Christ's sake. It is the message you take out with you on Sunday, hopefully, I pray. The power of God rests therein to bring sinners into a saving relationship with him, that is, to faith or trust in the mercy and grace of God on account of Christ. This faith saves, not because of our merit, for Pete's sake, not even because of our faith, but because it is given by God in the preached gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit and because it rests solely on Christ alone. Thus says Melanchthon, this example teaches us that by the promise and faith we obtain reconciliation. Faith, therefore, does not strive after our own works or dignity, but rather to the whole mercy of God in Christ. So here we still stand. Again, we at 1517, the Legacy Project, are committed to proclaiming the gospel of Christ Jesus to as many people as possible in as many ways as possible. And we are extremely grateful to those heroes of the faith who followed Christ and proclaimed the gospel boldly. The apostles and people like Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, who cl by, by clearly teaching us regarding both God's law and his gospel, have shown us how to proclaim the forgiveness of God to sinners on account of Christ Jesus. This is what Melanchthon says about that. He says, thus, God has revealed through his mercy that he would forgive us and restore us to eternal life and put forward a victim for us, namely his own son, that we should know him on account of the gift of his son and not on the account of our own work or merit. This promise of the gospel is revealed immediately after the fall of Adam. Immediately, so that the church would not be without consolation. That's how great our God is. And this is that one insane gospel that all the saints from the very beginning of the world have held at all times. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, the prophets, and the apostles. May we be so bold as to add names like Luther and Melanchthon. 
And in our circles, names like Montgomery, Rosenblatt, Nestigan, Paulson, Bird, Brown, Zoll, and so many others. This is the legacy of the gospel. This is the legacy of the Reformation. This is our legacy. And on this legacy, we still stand. Amen. And thanks for coming to hear We Still Stand this weekend.